your features that you've been working on all summer are beginning to come out. And the one that I want to start with is your story about Luke Fickle and Wisconsin on FoxSports.com. And it's called Luke, uh, Luke Fickle's Wisconsin Vision, Protect the Past While Charting a New Course. I'm going to start this by saying Fickle told you a story about Coach Cooper. Uh, that'd be John Cooper, who was at Ohio State when he was being recruited there. And I'm also going to pop my collar here and say John Cooper was a Tulsa Golden Hurricane man before he was an Ohio State man. But the way that he had recruited him was by saying, hey, look, my kid could have gone anywhere. He decided to come play with me. I'm going to treat all of these boys that I'm recruiting from moms like my own son. What do you think? Is that going to work in today's day and age? Really good question. You know, I think he's a guy who attacks recruiting in a way that very few coaches do and that he truly enjoys it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I think most coaches in college football understand that they have to do it every day, all year round, but not all of them enjoy it. And I think Fickle genuinely does. Um, you know, there are coaches who preach the family vibe that aren't quite really family men. And Fickle really is, you know, part of the reason he stayed in the state of Ohio for as long as he did at, at uh, Ohio State and then Cincinnati was that he didn't want to uproot his family. You know, he's got six kids, two sets of twins. Um, they're very close with a lot of people in Ohio. And so I think it can work only because he is genuinely backing it up with what he does off the field. If you preach family, but then you don't really show it within your program, your wife's not coming around, your kids aren't coming around, the assistant coaches can't really have their families around either. I think that then rubs kids the wrong way. But if you preach family and then they see family, I think that that hits home for a lot of these guys. And because remember, these are these are young men that when they're coming through for unofficial and official visits are anywhere between the ages of 16 and 18, sometimes even younger for these camps and things. So these are guys that are still looking for family and they want to go to a place where they can feel safe. And if you can preach it and show it, that's better than just doing one or the other. As large as the University of Wisconsin is, it has always struck me as a very tight knit, close community knowing a lot of alumnus that come from alumni, excuse me, that come out of that place, uh, not to say nothing of, of what the football program has been able to do, but a big reason that they're able to keep that kind of culture intact is on a football field, it doesn't much change. And I stat from your story, 31 offensive linemen, 13 running backs drafted, more than a dozen 10 win seasons, six big 10 championships, and a stat that I found 21 straight winning seasons and not one single appearance and the national title game this century. Question is, do you think Luke Fickle thinks he can do what Barry Alvarez couldn't, which is win a national championship? I think he does. You know, Luke Fickle is a guy who had plenty of opportunities to leave Cincinnati over the course of his time there. His Bearcats teams were performing so well and so consistently that he was basically the biggest name in the coaching carousel, him and Matt Rule together, for like a couple of years, as soon as you know, they started to win big, especially when they went to the college football playoff, the first group of five school to reach the college football playoff. You know, so I think he had his choice of places he want to go, wanted to go. And he handpicked, essentially, Wisconsin for a lot of different reasons. One, he's a Big Ten guy through and through, having played nose tackle at Ohio State, 50 straight games um, without missing a game in the 90s. And so he knows that program. He's competed against that program. He's coached against that program. But I think he also understood what that place is like. You know, a lot of people, myself included, before I moved to the Midwest, I had absolutely no idea what Madison was like. And then the first time that I went there, it is an unbelievable place. I mean, that campus is located on a little spit of land in Isthmus in between two lakes that are giant and people are boating in the winter. They're ice fishing. It's a beautiful place. Families love it. Um, it's a very progressive place. So it, not only was it a situation where I think he believes he can win, but I think it's a place where he thought he could win and want to stay there for a really long time. Not unlike what we just heard Brett Bielema say recently, like he feels at home in Champaign. I think Luke Fickle feels at home in Wisconsin. And, and one of my favorite anecdotes from the story was when I talked to Jim Tressel. And Jim Tressel said, every time I talk to Luke on the phone now, he's trying to get me to come to Madison and says, you got to come up here for longer than just a game because these people are amazing. This place is amazing. So from the resources, the commitment, the passion being the only division one football program in the state. I think he views this as a place that has some untapped potential in the modern era. And I think he's going to push as hard as he can because he does believe that they can win a national title there. That point you just made is the one to raise for me, right? The one where 
they are the only division one program in the state. And the state is very much aware of that, right? They kind of built it out that way so that Wisconsin always has an opportunity to contend. I want to follow on that because Luke Fickle has had a really interesting journey, if not a very cool journey, having played for John Cooper on 90s teams that were just good enough, but not that good, right? Winning good enough to win national championships. We know what O2 was about for Ohio State. We know that he helped groom a guy like Marcus Freeman, a guy that I stand on the table for even now. And he was a part of that really rough transition from 2011 to 2012, where they were bad in 2011. They were undefeated in 2012 and stayed on until they won a national championship at Ohio State in 2014. And then again, making history again with Cincinnati being the first G5 team to make the playoff. I'm very excited to see what he can do at Wisconsin. I'm really, I'm fascinated what you think about Tanner Mordecai. And the reason I say this is I've known Tanner since he was in high school uh, at Waco Midway. And he's always been a dude that can sling it. He's always been a dude that's been laid back with his Southern drawl and doesn't have a whole lot to say. But it says something to me that Phil Longo said, no, 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 I need to go get him. And that Tanner has ingratiated himself into Wisconsin's ideology and how it goes about its business, not the other way around. Do you think there's reason to believe that Tanner Mordecai can not just break records set by Russell Wilson as lofty as this seems. Russ is the only dude to throw for 3,000 yards in season in Wisconsin, which tells you everything you need to know about Wisconsin football. But to lead them, perhaps to a Big Ten championship. Man, I mean, this is a, it's a year as always. I feel like we can say this every year that the Big Ten West is wide open because the Big Ten West is always wide open. But Wisconsin has a chance to get there, and it's because largely of Tanner Mordecai. And I think the biggest thing that, that you hit on that I want to talk about is – how he ingratiated himself to the program. Because when I asked Luke straight up, I said, did you think that this was a guy that A, could help you win, but B, could help grow your program, knowing that he's only going to have one year of eligibility left? And Fickle said, yes, absolutely. He said, I can tell you about his arm. I can tell you about all the throws he can make, all those types of things. But it's the stuff that he's done off the field to help lay the foundation and solidify the foundation of what uh, Luke Fickle and offensive coordinator Phil Longo want to do that they believe is going to be his lasting legacy, that he can show these guys, these younger transfers, because remember, they took two other transfers in the portal at quarterback as well. It wasn't just Tanner Mordecai. So they are trying to build for the future with uh, with Braden Locke and, and with Evers from Oklahoma. And these are guys that they think can build for the next couple of seasons if Mordecai can help lay the foundation, show them how to work, show them how to succeed at this level. So I think he's going to sling it around. I don't know exactly how much talent they have at wide receiver. You know, Wisconsin's always going to have tight ends. That doesn't bother me at all. But I think when you have two really good running backs and you want to sling it around, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's going to look like. I almost wonder if it'll look a little bit more like what Longo's offense was at North Carolina a few years ago where he had 2,000 yard rushers in the same season. So are they going to try and accommodate the run a little bit more early until they can, you know, start to work into the pass game? I'm fascinated to see what it looks like, but I think he's going to come really, really close, if not breaking those uh, records that Russell Wilson said. And here's another stat for you on that front, RJ. Russell Wilson's the last Wisconsin quarterback to get drafted. Given the identity at Wisconsin, right? They want to run the football. 28,000 yard rushers. This is from your story. Five 2,000 yard rushers in 30 years. My goodness. The the number of tailbacks I can think of off the top of my head Monty Ball, Melvin Gordon, Jonathan Taylor, Ron Dane, right? Do you think that Braylon Allen can join this club of exclusively great Wisconsin tailbacks? Man, I mean, <laughs> I don't think he's getting to 2,000 yards. I mean, that group you read off, not only are they some of the best running backs in recent memory, but like statistically, those are some of the best running backs college football has ever seen because a lot of those guys stayed for four years. Mm -hmm. And so I think Braylon Allen is going to be one of the better tailbacks in the big 10 this year, but you got to remember he's splitting reps a little bit with Ches Malusi as well. And so I think it's going to be maybe like a 65, 35 kind of a split 70, 30, somewhere in there. So he's not going to have the type of numbers that maybe Chase Brown had at Illinois last year where he was just getting the rock 30 times a game. But I think Braylon Allen is really talented. And, and the big thing about this offense is, yes, it's derived from the air raid. But when I was talking to their athletic director, Chris McIntosh, he said, I want to make this very clear. We may pass the ball more this season than we have in recent years. But really what this is about is spreading a team out to help facilitate the running game. Because essentially, everyone knew Wisconsin wanted to run the football over and over and over again under Paul Christ. 
And so because of that, they were doing it against eight and nine man boxes at times. And essentially now, if you spread the field with a couple tight ends, with three wide receivers, whatever the case may be, there's the idea that there will be more space for the running back because the defense just has to cover more of the 53 and a third yards, the width of the field. So I think he's going to have chances to rip off bigger runs. He's not going to go three yards in a cloud of dust as often as he has in the past, but I don't quite see him getting into that group of the elite tailbacks, partially because he's going to be splitting time with Ches Malusi. I'm interested to see how this goes because I love the idea of Braylon Allen getting to see a six man box as much as anybody else. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, Phil Longo had Michael Carter and Javante Williams in the same backfield, and they were destructive uh, with Sam Howell back there, and they threw the ball all over the yard. Is For me, it's not about whether or not you're going to be able to make people cover the length of the field. It's are you still going to be able to pop through to the second level and then see nobody else? This is what made Blake Corum such a threat at Michigan is you would load the box, and then they would block you out of the box, and there he goes, and you can't catch him. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But I, I understand why they are modernizing the offense and giving themselves more opportunities to move the football as opposed to, damn, now it's third and long. What are we going to do? I'm excited about that. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.